we're finding God in video games. Well, I'm finding God in video games, not so much Amy, who's joining us here today. She's Clean Fiction Magazine, and we are here to kind of shed a ministry spotlight on Clean Fiction and what they do, as well as the face and the person behind all of this. So, Amy, thank you for joining us today. I'm very glad to be here. I'm very excited. It was it was fun getting to know you a little bit, and we've been fans of Clean Fiction for a little while now and had the opportunity to collaborate a few times with you as well. But for those who don't know what Clean Fiction magazine is, or maybe just what magazines are anymore, because that's the way the world is gone, tell us about Clean Fiction magazine and where your idea for putting this together came from. Well, it all started when I published my first novel, I have been publishing things since 2014, but, you know, not in any big way. But when I finally got my novel out there, I was like, okay, I'm ready to get this Christian fantasy novel off the ground. So I went and I did all the traditional ways that you would market things. And there just was not a space for like clean things for adults. And I I wanted to fill that hole. Like there was plenty of stuff for teens, there was plenty of stuff for young kids, but I'm like, I'm an adult. I don't want to read about people in high school all the time. You mean they make books and movies about people that aren't teenage vampires? I would I just I didn't even know that there was I, a I know. Genre I know. It, it's out there though. Movies. It's out there. <laughs> I'm sure of it somewhere. So you started kind of collating some of this together and creating space mm-hmm. for other people like yourself so they could get the opportunity to get some of those stories out there, right? That's right. And because of the 2020 everybody had time to write a novel situation, there was a lot of adults in the space that uh, had never been in the space before, didn't particularly know one way or the other what they were supposed to be doing. And I was like going, hi, I'm over here doing the thing where I say, look at this awesome thing that you've done. <laughs> well, that is so cool. And I think it's it's interesting you speak to kind of the rise in people wanting to write because that's that kind of for a little while fell by the wayside. I, I came up very much someone that most of the way that I took in entertainment was in book form for a very, very large amount of time. Mm-hmm. And I think you had a very similar background and, and probably oh, still yeah. today we we consume a lot through written work. But now that entertainment, there's there's so many different channels and different ways. It's it's probably not the considered the most modern and relevant way that one would consume media, but it's also the easiest for a lot of us to create. So why is your passion around specifically the written aspect? Of, of, of well, fiction. it's more personal. When you consume media through a video or somebody reading something to you or experiencing things outside your body, it's not very personal. I mean, pe- influencers obviously are a thing. So like you feel like you know this person, but you don't actually know that person and all that jazz. But when you read a book, when you read the written word, you have to put the words in here to experience them. And so your mind is creating what it is happening on the page. So your experience of the book can be personal in a way that nothing else can. And that's why I'm passionate about it. I love that. And, you know, when we think of it in terms of our faith, I will say that there's, there's been several different Christian fiction works that have been very special to me over the years. My personal favorite and one that really changed the way I thought about Christian fiction was This Present Darkness. That was mm. like a really, at, it came at a very important time in my life where I'm not going to say that all of it should be considered like, oh yeah, this is absolutely what someone should understand what spiritual warfare looks like. But it just created a very unique lens that let me kind of create the imagery of thinking about it differently than I ever had before. It made it feel a little more modern and a little bit more real. Is there a particular work that really made you turn the corner from, I like this, I like reading it, to I'd like to create this? I think that there's an opportunity for me to support other people's visions of this as well. Well, I can say that my probably fantasy is my favorite. It is it is my my absolute favorite genre, though I am eclectic. I love all of them equally. But if I was going to say a favorite, it'd be fantasy. And I read Sabriel by Garth Nix. He's an Australian author, a little weird now, so I don't recommend him necessarily. (laughs) But uh, 
when I read his book and it was just so well thought out with the world building, I was like, going, wow, like this, this is a whole different world because I've been reading in like I was in seventh grade. So what does that make me 13? And I had been reading the stuff for 13 year olds and I'm like, oh gosh, oh, this is the bad guy. All right. He's going to do something bad. And then, oh, this is the good guy. Going to have a nice resolution at the end. Fantastic. Exciting. But I don't know. It was just too predictable. And this book, nothing about it. I predicted. I was like, <laughs> going, okay. All right. This. But then as I uh, became an adult and as I'm continuing to read, it was so hard to find clean fantasy, clean science fiction, anything that just explores the unknown like that. And uh, so finding these authors after writing my own novel, because like, I'm going to write something so that I can enjoy something that's clean and still goes out there into the crazy world of fantasy and science fiction. Um, I found authors like uh, Max B. Sternberg. He wrote the Rise of Light uh, trilogy, and that was just chef's kiss. So good. And being able to know him as a person, like, and be able to talk back and forth with an author was such a unique experience of the independently published space i'm like when i could actually tell him how awesome his book is <laughs> and it's interesting because authors really don't get the same level of notoriety even if they're writing something for screen like you, mm -hmm. you know directors you know producers of movies and those things but the people behind the actual writing of itself that i mean there's not a lot i can't name a lot of people that have written some of my favorite movies that i have ever enjoyed or television shows so it's it's kind of a different kind of person who chooses the path of being an author who really wants to get that vision out there, but also is less concerned about who they are and more concerned with what they're getting out into that audience. Mm -hmm. And I, when I think about that in terms of not just the Christian space, but the clean fiction space, here's here's kind of the conundrum is we want things that are that are clean that we can consume that speaks to us at an adult level, you know, that like you mentioned, isn't teen based. But at the same hand, sometimes it's fun that it's not so overtly in, in its religious imagery. Like, I like solving it for myself. Mm -hmm. I like kind of seeing how the pieces fit together and see it as an allegory. Is there any particular work that you're like, I really love the way that this worked on a Christian level without explicitly putting that out there as the component of it? I would definitely say that would be uh max max b sternberg's series there's there's a lot of other good ones as well but some are more overt some are less and i don't know he doesn't slap you with the message <laughs> i suppose is it like he he builds this world of everyone who passes away becomes a zombie because their soul has not been redeemed but you don't understand that until you're further on you just know that all the living people are fighting against every single person who has passed away. So it's a little tense because <laughs> they're going to get bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually they'll, they'll outnumber you very quickly. That's yes. My thought. Yes. So, uh, but he brings in a faith journey in a way that I aspire to in the respect that like he touches on forgiveness, he touches on uh, belief in the unknown in the respect of like angelic helpers and things of that nature, which is very fantasy, very fantasy to like touch on those things. But still, I didn't know what was going to happen next. I'm like, well, what, are you, what are you doing with this? Oh, okay. It was it was all the excitement of an Avengers movie without all the with all the fun dialogue that you get, like the back and forth, but without the, oh, is somebody going to be like partially <laughs> naked or, or like have a crude joke or whatever, nothing like that. So I don't know. It was a, a really good combination. Well, and, you know, I think that's the unfortunate side of even, you know, a lot of the fandoms that that I appreciate. There's so many aspects that I'm like, well, except for this part. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or I would love to recommend this, but I won't. And here's why. And but the reality is I still want to consume that kind of storytelling. Right. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The epic. That we, we got into those kind of things. But then those elements of it are the parts that you're like. 
why you didn't even have to put that in there. It didn't even add anything substantive to what you did. Mm -hmm. And now I can't, not only can I not recommend, I don't even know if I want to continue participating in it at that point. So my, my question to you is within the space that you're creating around clean fiction, how do you help people who are of faith, Christians to see the value in something that is going to be, you know, a fictionalized account, but also could still have a benefit to your Christian journey and sit comfortably next to our other fandoms, the things that we like, but doesn't have those aspects built into it. Well, and that's where the independently published space just shines because they're never going to get picked up by a normal publisher because they're not dishing out the tried and true. This is exactly the thing where there is a place for the more vanilla Christian fiction. There also is this, just like you, large group of people who enjoy these big epic tales that just reach the edge of human understanding and just taps a toe in the water of the unknown being like, okay, and then leaves you with how, how are you going to interpret this? Like, how does this make you feel? And I don't know, in, in the, in the manga space, they call it fan service when they're doing things that, you know, we would prefer not be in there. And I'm like going, actually, that's not fan service. <laughs> I'm a fan and I am not being served by this. Go away. <laughs> but when it comes to secular stuff within everything that is created, because our God is a creative God, even things created by non-believers, they cannot help but reflect the original creator. They can't help it. Like I went to go see Les Mis, which I don't know if you're into the and I'm watching the movie and there were things in it that I was like, oh, gosh, this is way too much. But like when you look at the the overarching theme, I'm like, how did they put this on the big screen and not. And not know that this this is a Christian themed work of fiction, oh, like, look at this, look at the redemption, look at how he reaches out for God, like looking how how even in the secular space, we're crying out for something more than ourselves. And that's why when people are like going, oh, you know, like that's secular, like I don't want anything to do with that. I'm like going, but look at it. These people from Japan are making anime and they don't know that they're reflecting the creator in what they're making, but it's still there if you're looking for it. Absolutely. I think that's that's an amazing thought around even secularized work that so many times that is a, a demonstration of looking for something more, reaching out for something else, trying to find, you know, make sense of the patterns that are being seen, but not fully being aware of what's behind. Yeah. Those patterns. So there's a, there's a lot of reaching and grasping and a lot of my favorite thing, you know, star Wars and those kind of things that I'm very into, you see those themes play out and granted, I know there's a lot of Eastern aspect to the religious. Oh yeah. That's on it, but it's because it's trying to emulate something that's actually real. And they're just trying to find a place to put that where it makes sense to them. And, and I find that to be really encouraging for the Christian fiction space, because we have the ability to have that direct reference. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we should be able to write the most compelling works and the most interesting, because our take on it is putting that critical component back into it. So with that, I would say there's a lot of people you mentioned that especially with, you know, COVID and everyone being housebound for like a lot of people started finding their love of writing or at least a passion for it. But the path to going from, I, I, I have a story in mind. I, I have, I have desires of communicating some of this, but how do I turn that into a written work that I could share with others is, is really difficult, especially now that, you know, people are back to work and doing normal things and balancing that can be really hard. I know in, in the space that we occupy here in the, in the finding god and video game space like i'm always like can when can i work on this video i'm gonna work on this for like the next two weeks just to get an eight minute video out yeah <laughs> because you're stealing time you're exactly. stealing time you're here and there pockets of it so what advice would you give being someone that you know obviously has written yourself on being able to 
get that passion out there while still realizing um, we all still probably have day jobs that we're trying to get done. Yeah. So doing these creative pursuits. Well, I get up really early in the morning before my children. Yes, I don't want that. No. <laughs> but my husband <laughs> is not a morning person. So he stays up late at night and funny. has that time without children. Good. And, uh, being an adult with children is different than someone who's single. You might just have to set aside time when you're not working and not consuming whatever amount of videos you're consuming that day or social media you're consuming that day. But you have to really want it because otherwise you're not going to find the time. And I know that 2020 was freeing for a lot of people because it was their someday. Like I have this, I have this on my heart, but someday I have it here, but I don't have the time now. Like I'm growing my business. I'm growing my family. I'm trying to get through college. My someday, and their someday arrived. Kacha. <laughs> and they grabbed it because they wanted it. And I mean, I wouldn't be doing anything that I would be doing if A, the Lord wasn't calling me to it because that sure helps. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that would be that would be the first part of success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the calling is the the little bee in your ear that's going, are you doing that thing? The thing, the thing that I asked you to do, the thing. Did you do it yet? The thing that I asked you, that one. Because what does it make any sense for a at that point I was a stay-at-home mom. I was taking watching extra kids other than my own, my niece and my nephew. And had five kids, four of which were in diapers, juggling all this ridiculousness and helping out my family as a remote uh, job for their business. And God's like, okay, make a magazine. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You see this? <laughs> no, I don't have time for that. Because I, I, my family's in the publishing space. They publish a weekly newspaper that goes out in our local community. Have been doing it for 51 years now. Yeah. So I was like, I have all the skills to do this. That's fine. Time, I don't have. So it was, so it's, you know, him first, then finding the time, being passionate about it, and being tenacious. Those would be my top three. I mean, he's he's the top, top tier. But like the other ones is holding on and being tenacious because that's usually people get to the end of the race, meaning like they publish the book and they're like, OK, I did the thing. I finished. I'm like, no, no, it has just begun. It has just begun <laughs> because now you have to market it. Now you have to tell people about it. Now you have to get people to read it. And uh, I, that's where I come in. <laughs> I finished the thing. Come over here. I, I will tell people a, about the thing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great point because you, you think about it. And even with the Bible, like if, if the people that wrote like the gospels, like, all right, I wrote my account of the Bible. Cool. Now I'm going to put it on a shelf somewhere and it's just going to stay there. For, well, then we would not have the gospel of Matthew. Like, mm -hmm. And after that, you have to evangelize. You have to get it out there. You have to give it an opportunity to land into different hands, be heard by different ears, seen by different eyes so that it will get a chance to, to duplicate and, and find its audience. So I, I think that's probably the part where a lot of people are at now is, all right, maybe I'm close to where I want to be with what I'm doing or at least have mm -hmm. different concepts, but I'm, I'm terrified of... Well, how do I go from here to there? The challenge with our society right now is because there's more entertainment options than ever before. Mm. Being found is is very very difficult. Like there's there's millions of books on Amazon right now. There's, oh yeah. Like the ability you just search one random word. If I just type chicken in in book, <laughs> and, yep. and like I will probably find hundreds of thousands of options, and not all of them will involve cooking the chicken. Some of them will involve actual chickens on adventure. Some of them might be a chicken story like Chicken Little that I've heard about. But and and then some of it might be my life as a chicken or something. I don't know. But there will <laughs> be so much out there in just that little bit of space. And when you're trying to find that space in in the Christian world, it's already going to be a, a niche. Mm -hmm. and then on top of that, how do I then start taking that and getting that out there? So obviously, Clean Fiction Magazine stands as an opportunity for people. Yes. So how would someone that is in that place now get in contact with you about the opportunity of trying to get it out there? 
uh, all you have to do is go to the website, click submissions. They're completely free. So if I wanted to get this, you mentioned that there's an electronic version. So where all would we find so we can follow clean fiction and be able to look at it from a support standpoint? What, where can we find you? Where can we follow you? Well, we have our main website as cleanfictionmagazine.com. So that's the main place you can find us. But you could also find us on Facebook as Clean Fiction Magazine, Instagram as Clean Fiction, YouTube as Clean Fiction. We got a lot of clean fiction going on. I'm sensing a theme. I'm really surprised <laughs> that that wasn't something that somebody had already claimed at some point. What is this I know. World? That there, at no point did anyone think that clean fiction should be something that was that was snatched up as a property. But hey, you got it. So yeah, got- the only thing I wasn't able to get was cleanfiction.com. Somebody oh. got that before me. And I was like, oh, dang I it. Agree. I got everything else. <laughs> <laughs> do they actually do they do anything with it or is it just? No, no. Somebody things? just owns it once you spend two thousand dollars to buy it. And I was like, no, thank nice. you. Nice. I remember when we were doing Finding God in video games, I'll tell you, we started out, it was Finding God in the world of video games. And then that was, well, you, you understand, you're right. Like that's just, that's long. And, Mm -hmm. and and there's just too many ways that you can mistype that when you're typing it in and go to horribly different places. So we, we decided to shorten like, we better hurry and find the domains for this. (laughs) (laughs) It has an opportunity to not be there. Cause that's what I was worried about is somebody's going to grab a domain squat on it. And then I'll, I'll forever be Finding God in VG instead of finding God and <laughs> might have done better. I don't know. You have to know this is coming if you're a writer. So you feel called by God to share something. You feel like you've got a story in your heart and it's burning and you're starting to get it out there. And then you hit a wall. And mm-hmm. it, and I'm not just talking about writer's block. We all deal with that. But I'm talking about like, you're just like, okay, am I even supposed to be doing this? And was this just, oh, this was just part of a journey. Should I quit? Should I give up? God got me to here, but maybe that's the story. And you start thinking that you've made a mistake in pursuing this. What would you tell someone that's in that place where they're not just at a blocked place? They're at a, I just don't know if I heard God right. Mm. Well, and that's something that the enemy uses to his advantage more often than we would like to admit. Uh, It is completely normal and natural to feel terrified of taking something that is so very personal which is writing and putting it out into the internet space where people are terribly, mm, what's a nice way (laughs) to put this honest, terribly honest about how they feel about your item. Okay. And to be honest, when I published the first magazine, I had so much nerves (coughs) that I gave myself shingles (laughs) at 35. Because it, it, I'm, I'm like going, I've told people I am called to do this. I told people that this is what the Lord wants me to do. He wouldn't leave me alone. And I'm like, going, okay, I'm going to put it out there. But what if he makes me a liar? What if it's not the right thing? And so I'm like, okay, all right, Band-Aid. Ah, okay, it's out there. Now what? And like, I had worked myself up so much for literal nothing. It hit number one new release on Amazon within its first month and stayed there for literary criticism, which is what our magazine is. Well, we nicely criticize, not not any of the mean stuff. It's it's so important, but I, I think sometimes that when we receive that critical feedback, we're like, okay, well, if I did this for God, shouldn't it have been perfect? Like, how could there be opportunities for feedback in it? And that's, especially when you're in a creative endeavor, you have to expect that Mm. there's going to be aspects, even of the work that we do for the Lord, that are going to be improved on over time. Like, you're not going to be perfect on day one. We're we're all writing for the Lord, but none of us are writing the Bible for the Lord. (laughs) We're we're writing new things. (laughs) Yes. So, when when we get that tough feedback or criticism, I think you know it's it's a gift, not always an, a wanted one. But within that, we should be taking that and say, well, that's because the Lord isn't done with my work yet. I'm going to do something. Oh yeah, that I'm that's that's going to be what the next step is is applying that feedback. I've found this a lot, and I don't know if you found it the same way, but in the the Finding God in video game space, I will tell you that the harshest criticism that we receive and the meanest comments that we get are from Christians. They are from mm. people who are like, I just don't approve of anything that you're doing here. I'm like, we just did an allegory about Legend of Zelda and the armor of God. This is this is upsetting. And they're like, yeah, mm-hmm. it's unacceptable. You shouldn't ever turn someone towards a video game. I'm like, 
pretty sure billions of people play Legend of Zelda, and a lot of them are probably Christians. I get that there's a lot of bad stuff here, but we're we're not exactly saying that we're going to take Grand Theft Auto and turn it into an allegory for people with mm-hmm. applications. So with within this space, like I know there's probably some people who are like, well, if they're reading fiction, then they're not spending time in the Word of God. Mm-hmm. How do you address that? We we still have an opportunity. We're all consuming media. We're all mm-hmm. consuming entertainment. There should be a place where we have the opportunity to have this clean fiction concept here. We're going to consume these things anyway. If yeah. everybody who says, I, I you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a stoic Christian. And I say, yeah, but have you read Harry Potter, though? They're like, well, I don't want to talk about that on video. Mm-hmm. But you have, haven't you? You just don't want to admit it, and you won't tell anybody in church, but you did it. I found the same thing when people are like, hey, I watched your thing about Call of Duty, and uh, I play Call of Duty, but don't tell anybody. Like, it's okay. I'm not gonna, it's, it's allowed. I'm going to judge you. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to play it anyway, so let's let's talk about it, right? Let's mm-hmm. find something positive that we can speak to about it. So. In in your genre, I'm sure you you've probably gotten some. Of oh, that. fantasy is the big one. Fantasy is like you can't be a Christian and enjoy fantasy. You can't. There's Christian fantasy. What the heck is that? <laughs> the trees shouldn't be talking. Trees. Oh. Talk, there's no trees well, in the Bible that talk. With okay. with two with two <laughs> exceptions, C.S. Lewis <laughs> and Tolkien. <laughs> everybody else, like everybody else heresy i've been called let's see i've been called a heretic a bigot i have been called all sorts of terrible things by the christian community and it does make me chuckle a little bit which i suppose it shouldn't make me chuckle but i'm like going guys you remember the pharisees (laughs) you know what happened to them Jesus they didn't care that. for Jesus analogies either, if I remember correctly. The huge problems with those. No, no, they had problems with the Son of God's words. Okay, so considering I'm not the Son of God, I am a daughter of God, but like not the Son of God. Like the fact that you're being visceral at me doesn't have anything to do with my worth. Doesn't have anything to do with the Lord. What the Lord has told me to do. Here's the way I see it. And I have read Harry Potter and I did not like it. <laughs> like it. I got to book four. It was too predictable. <laughs> I knew from book one that Snape was going to be the hero in the end. I'm like going, no, I'm not spending my time with this. Oh, sorry. Spoilers. Oh, yeah. If you're one of the four people that didn't know through either the movies or the books, there's a point in which Snape is going to have a moment of redemption. Like every other person that introduces themselves in a similar way. You know. So sorry, guys. Sorry. It just came out. I'll make sure to put a big spoiler alert on the screen. Like, spoiler alert. Snape turns out to be helpful. <laughs> but... Like, well, when an author goes in so hard, so hard that this person is evil, I'm like, going, mm-hmm, yeah, so hard that that person is evil. But anyway, back to the, back to the topic. Sorry, got off on a tangent. <laughs> but fantasy has been such a pariah in the Christian fiction space because we choose to explore magic in a way that like a Christian can explore the gifts of God. A lot of Christian fantasy has to do with their power of whatever it is, is their spiritual gift. I'm like, what's wrong with that? People heal people with their spiritual gifts. Like that's a supernatural thing. So I suppose, you know, barring Lewis and Tolkien, because they they win for their allegory and, (laughs) and all that, okay, why can't a modern person also do those things? Mm-hmm. And and it's it's a hard line to walk, and it's not a real great place to be if you don't want to be criticized. Which, like, I had a lady give me a three star review saying that she wouldn't get this ter- for her church library, and I was like, my church library carries my magazine. I mean, my three stars doesn't... isn't the. I've, I've gotten worse than three stars. Let me tell you, <laughs> me three stars. Oh I, no, oh, it's oh, the com. It's a comment section. Usually, they don't take the time and energy to rate <laughs> something. No, so like I don't got that, time. That is the absolute most bitter edge of things to be like. That's right. I'm taking the time to click in the. <laughs> That's right. 
But I think that us as Christians, there's always going to be Pharisees. And giving in to those Pharisees is when you're going to find problems. Because if God is calling you to do something, whatever it is, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun. It is going to be time consuming. And he doesn't promise us ease. He doesn't promise us good the good things in life. He promises us persecution. Absolutely. So if you're expecting to go into it and not feel persecuted, hmm, maybe you're not doing what you should be doing if you're not being persecuted. <laughs> And if, if you're not getting any kind of critical feedback, mm. then you're probably only submitting it to people that are, sure, ultra supportive. And that's great. But they're not growing you. They're not helping mm -hmm. you necessarily by saying there, there's times that oh, yeah. would reach out to me. And, and yes, it hurts when someone tells you that. But also they're like, look, you need to get a new mic, dude. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> the audio quality is the worst. And I was like, but we're working so hard and we're doing this on no budget, but they're right. Like I'd listen to it. And I'd be like, okay, this is the worst. It's got to go. <laughs> we have to do something. So I think there's a component of that. Like, yes, find the value in the critical feedback, but also like you mentioned, there's going to be people that critique it simply because they don't want this kind of work to exist. And if we mm -hmm. let that prevent us from delivering on what we feel the Lord is calling us to do, then we're the ones at the end of the day that yeah. are responsible for what the Bible demonstrates is taking our talent and burying it in the ground when we were supposed to go out and yeah. invest it and give it an opportunity to grow for the kingdom. And it won't all grow at the same rate. You know, one person went out there and they doubled theirs, the other person doubled theirs, but they each started with different amounts. That's okay. But you do need to go out there and invest. And I think that's the beautiful thing about what, what you're doing is giving people the space to invest their talents into a place mm -hmm. where has the opportunity to multiply. The last thing that we would want anyone to do is take that talent that the Lord has given oh, yeah. and bury it in the ground simply because you know that it may not get the large audience you want or the appreciative audience you hope. I also, it's allowed me to stay humble in the respect that, yes, our magazine has hit number one new release in literary criticism eight times running. I only have eight magazines. Okay. I'm like going, yes, success. But then the other half of me is like going, literal anybody could do this. Literal anybody. Other people are doing it. There's there's this uh, what is it? Family, family fiction magazine, which I had no idea existed. Already been doing this stuff for 20 years. I'm like what? Oh, that's that's great. I just didn't find you. <laughs> or 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 like God, God was like, no. Don't go to that part well, of the maybe, internet. Maybe if you had known, you wouldn't have done it otherwise. That's right. If That's I had right. known that there was other people in the God and gaming space, I probably would have said, okay, they got it. They don't need me. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, they'll do just fine. And I would have gone back to just playing video games instead of writing about them. And mm -hmm. about them. But I think the Lord did, to your point, shield me from the knowledge of that. So I would go out and try to do these things. So how would we find you? How will, what's, what's, what's the handles and what's the things to find clean fiction? Well, let's see. I'm on YouTube under clean fiction and that's the clean fiction audio situation where I'm taking audio books for people who might have visual impairment and making sure that they have like reviews for the audio books that have already appeared in our magazine, the website, cleanfictionmagazine.com. Uh, on Instagram is Clean Fiction. On Facebook is Clean Fiction Magazine. So, like, if you just type in, you clean, clean fiction, fiction, we're gonna find you. Yeah. <laughs> well, Amy well was... nobody. It was too general. Nobody had it. So I was like, I'm fine then. It was out there. You got it. <laughs> so thank yeah. you so much for enlightening us on clean fiction and everything that it means to all of the people out there that are literary readers. We appreciate being a collaborator with you. And if you want to find clean fiction, now you found your place. Thank you for joining us. I'm Finding God in Video Games, Zany for Clean Fiction, and we hope to see you in the pages of the next magazine.